I think we're going to worship the Lord together through song. So if you please stand and join with us, we'll worship the Lord through our first song, Greater. Worth a 
I pray, Lord, as we go throughout the rest of the service today, that your name is praised, that you are glorified, that we leave here closer to you than when we came. And Father, I do pray now, for those here in our congregation, you, you know full well who needs healing. You know full well those who have come here with burdens on their heart, maybe. You know full well what's going on behind closed doors. And so, Lord, we ask now that our lives might be a reflection of Jesus. We ask now, Lord, for your healing for those here that need healing. We ask for your encouragement for those that need encouragement. We pray for those that are not here today, those that may be watching this online today. You know full well what's going on in each and every one of our lives, and I thank you for being a God who cares about even the littlest intricate detail. Today, as we open your word, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts in a way where all the other distractions are drowned out. Whatever it is that we may have heavy on our heart that may be trying to rob us of our attention, I pray that you focus, help us to focus on your word today. And may you be glorified and honored and praised now and forever. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. If you have your Bibles with you, um, just a little reminder, three weeks ago we were in Daniel, and we've been going through Daniel, we're in the sermon series now that we've been covering, well, for a few months now, and this sermon series, which is Daniel, Integrity Despite Opposition. Uh, two weeks ago we ended with the last part of Daniel chapter 5, which told us that Darius the Mede is receiving the kingdom. And the kingdom of Babylon at this point, of what we're starting with today in Daniel chapter 6, is no more. And instead, the Medo Persians has taken over, and Darius here is the king. So we'll keep that in, in mind as we go throughout. Probably one of the most familiar chapters in all of the Bible. Um, if you grew up in church, or even if you didn't grow up in church, you probably know the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, we're not going to look at Daniel being in the lion's den today. That will be next week. We're going to look at what led up to that today. So when chapter 6 of Daniel opens up, we see that uh, Babylon has been taken over by the torso and the arms section of the statue of Daniel's interpretation to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2, in this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of this statue. And this, so this is the next part from the head moving down to the torso and the arms that Daniel said this kingdom is going to be the Medo-Persians. So the Medo-Persians have taken over the land, and at this time in history, this is the largest most powerful empire ever. Their empire covered from the Atlantic Ocean all the way east towards India and a little bit north towards Turkey. So, in other words, as our president would put it, this nation was huge. So it should be as no surprise that Daniel starts out chapter 6 by telling us here about all these sorts of officials that Darius appointed throughout the empire. He couldn't do this, on, he couldn't govern this all on his own, so he had to get some help, which is why he named some of these satraps and these commissioners, as we're going to see, throughout his land. Now, at this point in Daniel's life, Daniel's not sitting on the sidelines much like he did in what we looked at in Daniel chapter 5, where Belshazzar, the 
king of Babylon was in charge, and basically Daniel was forgotten at that point. So he's not forgotten at this point. He's not tossed aside. Even though this is a different empire, Daniel is still holding a very prominent position, much like he did when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was in charge. Daniel is, is basically a prime minister here in the Medo-Persian army, or in the Medo-Persian empire, and as we're going to see, as we go throughout this chapter here today, Daniel, even though he's in this prominent position, even though he is uh, basically serving as a commissioner, one of three, that is, even though he's in the position that he is, he still has his enemies. King Darius loved him. But Daniel still had his enemies. Those who didn't like him. Those who opposed him. Why? Because he served the Lord. The same is the case for us as believers in Christ today. As his followers, we will have those around us who claim will not like us. Simply because of who we serve. Not because they may have a personal problem with us and who we are, but because we're associated with Jesus. They will probably have a problem with us. So as believers, don't get, ever get into the mindset that you're ever going to come to a place where everybody's going to like you. Okay? Don't believe that lie that you can come to a place in your life where you're going to get along with everyone. Because the fact of the matter is, you're not. And maybe you're in the midst of that right now, and you're saying, yeah, I, I know that full well, then there's quite a few people that don't like me. I remember, before I entered the pastorate, a pastor mentor of mine, whom I looked at as like a second father, he said to me, hey, one of his parting words, one of the two of his parting words was this, the first of his parting words was this. He said, when you enter the ministry and you've been going along for a while, if you find that everyone around you, not just within the church, everyone in your community, everybody that you come into contact with, if you find that you're getting along with everyone, you better check your Christianity. You better check your ministry. This, there's a lot of truth in that. The second piece of advice that he shared with me is he, he was a little bit of a heavier set guy. And he said to me, Tyler, if you're ever going to be a real pastor, you have to be a fat pastor. Yeah. I'm working on that. So yeah, he had some really good advice. He also had some humorous advice as well. But that... that Everyone liking us, if we're a believer in Christ, that, that thing that he had to say about that, that was really true. In fact, isn't that on the lines of what Jesus said in John chapter 15, 18 through 19? This is from the New Living Translation. It says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as its own, as one of its own, if you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. And then if we look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, this is from the New American Standard Bible, it says, Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. So these are some words here. Uh, these are some words here that we're told that should give us as no surprise to us when we find out that someone just plain doesn't like us because we're associated with Jesus. Pastor and author Tim Chalice says this about this verse here of 1 John 3, 13 in this area of things. He says, but why? Why are we hated? Why is it that we should not be surprised when the world turns against us? Because Cain hated Abel. Just one verse earlier, John had spoken of these two brothers and asked why one murdered the other. Cain murdered Abel because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. 
Abel's goodness exposed Cain's badness. Abel's righteousness convicted Cain of his unrighteousness. Abel's love for God silently declared Cain's disregard. Cain responded with the ultimate manifestation of hatred. He murdered his own brother. Your goodness unmasks the badness of the unbelievers around you. Your light illumines their darkness. Christian, you must expect to be hated today for the same reason. Your goodness unmasks the badness of unbelievers around you. Your light illumines their darkness. Your truth exposes their error. Your holiness declares their depravity. Your sins stand in judgment of them. It convicts them of their guilt. It shows them who God expects them to be. And all of this is true even though you are so far from perfect. Even though so much of the old man remains. Even though you and I still sin. No unbeliever can articulate this, of course. The very sin that is exposed by your holiness is the sin that keeps them from seeing it or acknowledging it. But the Bible declares it so. My friend, the more you love and honor God, the more you expose the evil of those who do not. The more you expose the evil of those who dishonor God, the more they'll hate you. They'll hate you because of who you love, because of who you resemble. They hated Jesus, and they'll hate those who are like Jesus. So as we look at this first part of Daniel chapter 6 today, we're going to see that despite Daniel's help and the integrity that he holds to and held to in his past, there were those who were still out to harm him. In this, we're going to tie in how we can apply what we learn today to our lives as well. So let's dig into this. If you've got your Bibles with you, we were going to start off here in the first verse of Daniel chapter 6. Once again, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Let's look at the first three verses here. All opposition to God is essentially deceptive. So Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, we'll start off with. It said, It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. And over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. So here we see, as I mentioned earlier, that King Darius, who is the king of the Medo-Persian Empire at this time, has such a large territory, he puts 120 satraps and administrators in charge over different parts of that empire. And all of those satraps reported to three commissioners. One of those commissioners was Daniel. But what jumps out to you here is verse 3. These, of these three commissioners, Daniel was the one who was finding favor with everyone particularly the king. God was allowing another king to see and experience the capability that he was giving to Daniel. This capability to lead. And we see this in the phrase, an extraordinary spirit. If you have an English Standard Version, it uses the phrase, an excellent spirit. In the Hebrew, what that means is it's talking about how in every aspect of Daniel's life, integrity was seen and was evident. So God had given Daniel a sense of history, leadership ability, administrative ability, and responsibility, all on a wide and far-reaching basis. And beyond all that, God had given him this ability to interpret dreams and visions. Giving him, giving everyone the idea of what was to come in the future. All of these things would have made Daniel an invaluable asset to a king. Would you agree? Oh yeah. It would have made him the MVP of the league. It would have made him first pick on the team. The, the head of the cool table. You get the idea. And it's because of all of this 
that we read in the last part of verse 3 that Darius planned to place Daniel as second in command under the king, over the entire empire or kingdom. God placed Daniel right where he wanted him, and he allowed Darius to recognize Daniel's capability to lead. What a beautiful thing it is when someone who is in a position to hire or to appoint someone to come alongside of them and lead, how beautiful it is when that person who is in that position to do that hiring or to do that appointing when they see the character of someone that attracts them and says, this person would be a huge advantage to helping me lead. Because this person holds to their integrity. What a beautiful and yet rare thing that that is that we see today. An example of this from the Bible is I think of Joseph. Sold by his brothers into slavery appointed to a position with Potiphar. Potiphar leaves him in charge of his all, all of his household, except as Joseph knows, his wife belongs to Potiphar, so Joseph's going to have nothing to do with, with being with her. But yet she wants to be with him. In worst times, you know that many of you, if you know your, your Bible, know the story. Is this what you guys were teaching on in Sunday school today or something? I'm seeing some laughing in the back. Or else, no. Do I got like a hair out of place or something? No. Okay. I didn't know. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens where people are like, oh man, this is exactly what we talked about. But um, So Joseph flees from Potiphar's wife's advances. She claims he came on to her. He's thrown into prison. Fast forward time a little bit. He's there for quite a while until he is appointed as second in command to Pharaoh because Pharaoh saw the integrity of this individual. Look at verses 4 through 9 of our text for today. Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to governmental affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Then the commissioners and satraps began or came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows, King Darius live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, that is, the injunction. Boy, is this not deja vu? Did we not read something about this similar back in the early parts of Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Here we go all over again. Hear me when I say this. Whenever a man or a woman is lifted up by the Lord to a place of prominence, you can always expect some sort of pushback from the world. It may be envy. It may be anger. It may be hatred. Darkness will always be contentious to the light. <coughs> and in that contentiousness, could very well see deception take place. And in fact, most of the time you do. Much like you see here in these verses and what we looked at in verses 4 through 9. These commissioners, these satraps, these governors, all these officials come together and conspire against Daniel. And they try to deceive the king 
with this, this idea of this decree. This isn't the only time in scripture that we see deception come from those who are contentious towards those who are being used of God. The Apostle Paul dealt with this very thing when he said what he said in Philippians chapter 1. So hold your place here. We'll come back to it in just a second. Turn to Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 12. Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without, without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former pro proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than for pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. The contentious preaching of Christ from those who wanted to negatively affect Paul's ministry, it ended up backfiring on them in the response that Paul gives here in what we just read. If you're listening, say amen. Amen. When God lifts someone up, other people's hearts have a common pattern tendency to burn in rage, jealousy, envy, or bitterness. Even when that individual that God lifts up didn't do anything to harm anyone else who's envious of them. That was the case with Daniel, and if you think about it, wasn't that the case with Jesus? So this isn't a new thing that we're seeing. Verse 4 of our text says that as much as they tried to find something about Daniel, that they could pin against him some sort of dirt, anything, his character and integrity proved there was no skeletons in his closet. Now, it doesn't take us long to live before we start getting skeletons in our closet, right? We all have a past. Daniel, at this point in his life, is not 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, or even 80 years old. He's in his 90s. So there's quite a long time of dirt that they could have tried to dig up on it. And because they could not, they set their sights on getting him in his commitment to God. Here's the thing, folks. When those who oppose us as believers who are sold out for Christ, when they can't smear us with something that goes against our integrity, they'll go right to our stance upon the scriptures. Which fulfills, really, the New Testament principle that Peter talked about in suffering for righteousness' sake. He says this in 1 Peter 3, 13 through 16, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience, 
so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. In ancient China, the people desired security from the barbar barbaric hordes of the north. So what they did is, this is how the Great Wall of China came about. It was too high to climb over, too thick to break down, too long to go around. Security had achieved. The only problem was that during the first hundred years of the wall's existence, China was invaded three times. Was the wall a failure? Not really. For not once did the barbaric hordes climb over the wall, break it down, or go around. So does anyone know how these three times that they were invaded, anyone know how that happened? Made a deal. There's a deal. Okay, one of you passed history class. Great. Yep. Yes. How they get in, the answer lies in human nature. They simply bribed a gatekeeper and marched right through. Yep. The fatal flaw of the Chinese defense was placing too much reliance on a wall and not enough in an effort to care about the character of the gatekeeper. Such was not the case with the character of Daniel. What can be said about your character? Once again, because they couldn't dig up any dirt on Daniel, they conspired and duped the king in deciding a decree that he alone was supposed to be the sole recipient of prayers and petitions. Forget this, 30 days. Does that seem a little fishy to you? Oh, king, let's, all make, let's make this decree where nobody is going to make petitions or prayers to anyone except for you. A king, well, who would King would be like, wow, that sounds great. You're still on? Yep. Okay, good. Yeah. We're going to fix that. So let's make this decree, King, for 30 days. Wait a minute, what? 30 days? Doesn't that seem fishy? Well, no, King Darius is like, hey, this is great. Let me sign it. Where do I? Give me a pen. And he signs this decree. Well, something I want you to notice before we look at what we're going to close with today. Is this cutting in and out now? No, no, it's good. It's good? Okay. Um, something I want you to notice before we close today is in verse 7. What does it say about this decree? It says it's a statute and an injunction. That means there's a doubly tight decree around this. That there was no way that this was going to be revoked, that there was no way that this could be canceled, that there was no way that this could be changed. Nobody could get away with violating this. In those days when a decree was signed, in this manner, it's binding. You can't violate it. And that brings us to what I want to close with today. A picture of spiritual resolution and growth. Look at how Daniel responds when he hears the news of this new decree. Look at verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house, paged a few hitmen, and took out the commissioners. Yeah. I'm glad you all paid attention to that. No. He entered his house, went on Facebook, and started some juicy gossip and petitions against King Darius and his decree. No. He was a Democrat. Oh. All right. We won't go there. He entered his house, now in his roof chamber. He had windows open towards Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. Daniel's first response wasn't to try and get back at those 
who might have been responsible for putting this whole thing into motion, it wasn't that he sat down and tried to think of a way out of this. He prayed. Boy, is that an example for you and I. I'll speak for myself here. I'm not going to speak for you guys, but when, oftentimes when something happens that is out of my control, and that happens to all of us, right? Something that happens in our lives that's out of our control. To be honest with you, a lot of times my first response isn't to go to prayer. As a man, my first response is, how can I fix this? Right? Guys, don't let me hang Oh, oh, right? <laughs> my first response is trying to figure out how I can fix this. How I can make things better. Daniel gives us the example. Why is it that so many times we go to prayer as kind of almost like a last resort? We try everything else and it doesn't work, so I might as well pray. I'll give you a really simple example of this. I lost something a while ago. I looked everywhere for this thing. I mean, everywhere. I checked, double check, triple check, every check. And I could not find this thing. And I got to the point where I was just like, somebody stole it. You, know, you ever go there in your mind where you can't find it? Somebody took it. And so you start looking around, and who, the first person you see is usually your first suspect, right? Usually it's my kids. I stopped and I thought, you know what? I'm going to pray. Lord, I know this is a frivolous thing, but I really need to find this. Can you, can you help me find this? Do you want to know what happened? I looked in the same spot I had looked at five times before and it was there. Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> or so I thought I looked there five times. This is just an example. Why do we go to prayer as a last resort? Look at the example of Jesus. How many times did he go away by himself to pray? If he did it, what makes us think we don't need to? He prayed, Daniel did, just like he had regularly done. In his upper chamber, with his windows open facing towards Jerusalem, which was most likely because that's where the longing of his heart was. For the people of God, for the city of God, which symbolized God to him. And Daniel would pray, no doubt, for the peace of Jerusalem, the restoration of the city, and whatever else was on his heart. Verse 10 here says that he didn't do this just once or twice a day, but religiously three times a day. It echoes what David wrote in Psalm 55, 16 through 18. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many against me. For there were many against me. For us, I believe what we can take away from this are some key principles. And what we see Daniel do here in response to the bad news that's being delivered. The witness to us here is that sometimes we feel like and I'm guilty of this too. Sometimes we feel like when our faith is challenged that we need to somehow publicly make a statement about this. Usually for most of us that's Facebook. So we have to make some public display in response to this. Uh, this is how I'm going to get my message across. I 
and granted there are times where, you know, I'm not bashing, I'm here bad, bashing Facebook today, okay? Boy, the pastor hates Facebook, doesn't he? <laughs> no, I'm not up here bashing Facebook. But I'm saying, does that take the place of prayer yeah. in your life? Honestly, that's a question that only you can answer. How much time do you spend praying compared to voicing your opinion on the social media side? That's true. What this shows us is not that Daniel was sinless here. It's not that he's perfect. What this shows us is that his heart was right with God. This is why he did what he did. He immediately went to prayer for the one who sustains him, the one who gives him the daily grace that he needs, the strength and the guidance that he needed. He trusted in the Lord because his heart was right. Now, let's look at how this plot thickens here. Look at verses 11 through 13. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to, cast, is to be cast in the lion's den? The king replied, The statement is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Those slimy, rotten scoundrels are waiting in the weeds, aren't they? Just waiting to catch Daniel in the midst of prayer, breaking this decree. It makes you so angry you want to do something like this. <laughs> Doesn't it? I mean, that kind of sums it up, right? All it took was one time for them to see Daniel praying. They go running back to King Darius and tattle on Daniel. You notice in verse 13 how they refer to Daniel. They don't refer to him as a fellow commissioner. They don't refer to him in a respectful manner. They call him one of those exiles. That no good Hebrew, that foreigner, that's the attitude that's behind then referring to him as an exile. Now before we look at how the king responds, I want, you to, I want to point out one thing. The decree here was law. But Daniel didn't follow the law. Was he wrong to do so? To answer this, let me share a just a little bit. This is well known now. This has taken place about a month ago. But I want to share with you a bit about how Grace Community Church, the church of John MacArthur pastors, how they handled something that was supposedly law about a month ago. John MacArthur writes this. He says, Christ is Lord of all. He is one true head of the church. He is also king of kings, sovereign over every earthly authority. Grace Community Church has always stood immovably on those biblical principles. As his people, we, were, we are subject to his will and commands as revealed in scripture. Therefore, we cannot and will not bend to a government-imposed moratorium in our weekly congregational worship or other regular corporate gatherings. Compliance would be disobedience to our Lord's clear commands. Therefore, in response to the recent state order requiring churches in California to limit or suspend all meetings indefinitely, we, the pastors and elders of Grace Community Church, respectfully inform our civic leaders that they have exceeded their legitimate jurisdiction and faithfulness to Christ and prohibits us from observing 
restrictions that they want to impose on our corporate worship services. As pastors and elders, we cannot hand over to earthly authorities any privilege or power that belongs solely to Christ as the head of his church. Pastors and elders are the ones to whom Christ has given the duty and the right to exercise his spiritual authority in the church. And scripture alone defines how, whom, how and whom they are to serve. They, are, they have no duty to follow orders from a civil government attempting to regulate the worship or governance of the church. In fact, pastors who cede their Christ-delegated authority in the church to a civil ruler have abdicated their responsibility before their Lord and violated the God-ordained spheres of authority as much as a secular official who illegitimately imposes his authority upon the church. Two government officials were respectfully say with the apostles, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. And our unhesitating reply to that question is the same as the apostles. We must obey God rather than men. Amen. Amen to that. Amen. Now, that has sparked quite a bit of different responses to that. Some people for and coming right alongside John MacArthur and, and saying the amens and others who don't agree with him. But look at Darius's response to these commissioners and satraps. When they brought the law once again before Darius's face, and this time it gets a little more personal. Look at verses 14 through the beginning part of 16. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exercising himself to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. Darius wasn't mad at Daniel. He wasn't even mad at this point at these men who brought these accusations. He was mad at himself. He had been dumb. Deeply distressed is the phrase that's used here. And scripture does not exaggerate. He stayed at this all day to try and figure out a way to save Daniel. But the law was the law. So Daniel had to suffer the consequences of the foolishness of the king. You know what I love about these last verses of our text for today? Daniel never tried to defend himself. In the face of the opposition and what looked like the end of his life, Daniel held to his integrity and his faith in God alone. Much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. My prayer for us as we end this first section of Daniel chapter 6 is that the Lord will give us that same kind of bold commitment to Him. To seek and to serve and obey Him even in the face of opposition. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We hear the phrases of people say, well, be like Daniel. I hesitate to say that because I say, be like Jesus. Lord, there are examples here that Daniel, that we see in Daniel's life that is an encouragement to us. But none of this is possible for us as believers if it isn't for Jesus. If it isn't for abiding in him. And so our trust is in Christ and in Christ alone. Lord, as we face what we face here in our country, what we may be facing in the future, 
Lord, I pray the example here of Daniel will be an encouragement to us to stand strong in the face of that opposition. We know that the world is going to wax worse until the end. But we as believers know the end of the story. That we will rule and reign with you. And so, Lord, until you return, help us to be about your business. Help us to stand upon the biblical principles and refuse to bend. Help us to be men and women of prayer. And Lord, may your name be glorified. May your name be honored. May your name be praised. You rule. You reign. You always have.